Good morning and welcome to the second meeting of the Pow and Chaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill Committee. The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take item three and all future considerations of evidence in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, we move on to second item. Today we were taking evidence from the promoters of the bill, the Pow and Chaffrey Commissioners and their representatives. And I would therefore like to welcome Joe Guest, Commissioner, Hugh Grierson, Commissioner, Alistair McKee, partner Anderson Strathairn, Ailey Callender, Senior Solicitor Anderson and Strathairn, and Shirley Davidson, Solicitor McCash and Hunter. I'd now like to invite the Commissioners to make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Committee members, clerk, clerks, officials and uh, members of the, of the public. Could also indicate that, that John McKenzie and Bill Drummond Murray, who are also Commissioners, are, are observing uh, proceedings today. Um, if I could just maybe indicate that, as explained to the committee clerk, our parliamentary draftsman is unable to attend today, but we will endeavour to answer your questions to the best of our abilities. But if there are particular technical matters, we may have to take the opportunity of responding in writing. Um, for, for your information, I have circulated copies of the original survey plan, which Mr Guest will be making reference to in his opening statement, and it will provide, I think, some important historical context, but is also relevant for the identification of the benefited land uh, under the POW bill. We've also circulated copies of the parliamentary plans, which are the up-to-date plans, but those, those actually match the, ben the benefited areas shown on that original survey plan. Um, as discussed with, with your clerk, um, Commissioner Jonathan Guest has a short opening statement to make, and I would simply invite him to make that statement. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Jonathan Guest. I'm a rural surveyor with over 40 years experience and I'm a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors and a director of Savills uh, UK Limited based in their Perth office. Um, I'm also a farmer with land situated within the area drained by the power of Inchaffrey. I've been the surveyor to the Power Commission for 30 years and have been one of the six commissioners for over 20 years. I walk the POW every year and I'm very familiar with its operation and the land which it benefits. My professional experience as a surveyor has included designing and organising land drainage schemes and also building construction. Um, if I could refer you now, please, to the location plan, which is in your pack. Um, um, before the POW and its side ditches were constructed, the low-lying land between Dollery and Methven Moss, extending to approximately 1,930 acres, was a boggy marsh. Um, if you look at your plan, on the um, right hand side you'll see Methven Moss and immediately, immediately to the right of that there's a number three on the, on the minor road. I'm afraid the plan's got slightly clipped, it should be 38. And that's the height in metres above sea level of the ground level at that point. And then if you go west along the plan, um, about halfway along the middle of the plan, along the blue dotted line, you'll see in Chaffery Abbey, which is uh, where the power of Inchaffery gets its name from, of which more later. And then a little bit further on to the left, you'll see it says Quarter Bank. And there's a bridge there called Ochlone Bridge. And you'll see another number, 39, which again is the height above ground level, as above sea level. And that tells you that between Methven Moss and Ochlone Bridge, the land is flat or even rises slightly. And if you then carry, follow the blue dotted line further along, um, you'll see Tuckett Hill and the blue line goes across a road there and that's Dollery Bridge. And uh, you'll see another number there, 37. So that's the height above sea level there. So there's a two metre drop between Ochlone Bridge and uh, Dollery Bridge. And then, if you follow the blue dotted line round, you'll see it comes round and joins the River Urn. And there's a contour there, uh, just to the 
right, which says 30 metres. So the height where the, the ground, of ground level height where the power joins the urn is slightly lower than that. So in effect, you've got seven, more than seven metres of fall in the last short distance. Um, the, so it's, it's, it's the drainage of the land, particularly uh, down to Dollery, which is absolutely crucial uh, from the point of view of the power. Um, the reason why there are such different gradients above and below Dollery is that at Dollery there's a, 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 a large area of hard sandstone bedrock, and this effect this this acts as in effect a sort of plug, which prevents water draining from the flat valley bottom upstream to Methven Moss. In the middle of this, what was a boggy marsh, there was a small island of dry land on which the monks built in Chaffery Abbey. The story goes that the abbot of Inchaffrey blessed the troops before Bannockburn, and in recognition of this, Robert the Bruce enabled the monks to commence work forming the Pow and draining the valley. With the dissolution of the monastery as a consequence of the Reformation, operation of the Pow uh, fell to the local landowners. This was first regulated in the 1696 Act in favours of the heritors adjacent to the Pow of Inchaffrey, was its title which I understand was one of the last acts passed by the Scottish Parliament before the Act of Union in 1707. In the 1840s, significant further improvement of the power was proposed by the landowner. Once again, the scheme was based on lowering the level of the sandstone plug at Dollery so that drainage of the land upstream could be improved. The high cost of the scheme necessitated the introduction of an equitable means of sharing the cost between the owners of the benefiting land, hence the 1846 Power of Inchaffrey Act. The central feature of the 1846 Act was a very detailed survey of the land which benefited from the power. What Alistair just handed you is a photograph of the actual plan itself, which is a thing about 10 foot long and is a fairly fragile document which belongs to um, the, the, Tony Murray, who used to live at um, Dollery. Um, the survey was conducted before the improvements were carried out and repeated on completion of the work after the 1846 Act. The surveyors assessed the value of the resulting improvement to each field within the benefited land. And this 1846 valuation forms the basis of the annual assessment, which each heritor, which is what the Act calls the people who own land within the benefited area, um, has had what they have paid ever since. If you consider the rateable values of UK business rates, which are revalued every five years, um, by comparison, the 1846 Act, POW Act, makes no provision for any revaluation. So the annual assessments levied by the Commission today are still based on the 1846 valuation. Whereas the rate in the pound for business rates is 46.6 pence in the pound, the rate for the POW is £17.50. This means that the current assessments are 17 and a half times the amount of the valuation, which in itself demonstrates the historical nature of the valuations, which are still used. In 1846, there were no buildings within the benefited area. The 1846 improvements enabled the Perth Creef railway line to be constructed. And if you look at the map, you'll see a dot dotted line showing dismantled railway, which for a considerable distance runs adjacent to the power, which wouldn't have been, couldn't have been built without the, without the 1846 improvements. Um, at Balgowan, there was a station and the limited number of houses were built associated with the station at that time. And since then, a few more houses have been were, were built uh, within the benefited area. Um, but a, a revaluation, although um, desirable, um, could only be achieved by means of legislation. The commissioners have always had a policy of economical budgets and the very high cost of promoting a new act at Westminster 
which we looked into um, oh, 25 years ago, was way beyond the means of the Commission, so it was dropped. The Manor Kingdom development uh, in the early 90s of an additional 54 houses at Balgaran incre increased the pressure um, for a revaluation. And opportunely, the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament seemed to mean that promoting a bill might just be within the means of the Commission. Here we are. All the residential properties rely on the POW for, and, and its tributaries for drainage of surface water and foul water. There are many other administrative features of the 1846 Act which have become out of date and impractical. The drafting of the new bill has been debated and discussed at great length by the commissioners and their legal advisers over the last three years. One recurring theme has been that the administration of the Commission must be as simple and straightforward as possible so that administrative costs continue to be kept to the minimum and the policy of economical budgets continued. The aim of the Commissioners is that the proportion of the budget spent on maintaining the POW is maximised so as to give the heritors good value for their money. The cost of introducing this bill has placed a huge strain on the Commission's finances and meant that very limited work has been carried out to the POW for the last three years. The 1696 Act operated for 150 years and the 1846 Act has operated for 170 years. It is hoped that by having uh, simple, future-proofed procedures that the POW continue to run econ be run economically and that this bill, if enacted, will prove to be as durable as its two predecessors. In conclusion, I would submit that the success of this bill is of vital importance to all those who benefit from the power of Inchaffrey. However, I would suggest that the bill is of much more than just local interest. There are many powers and man-made arterial watercourses in Scotland and throughout the UK. With flooding a topic of national interest, the maintenance and administration of these watercourses is a very important subject. This bill has the potential to influence the administration of other watercourses and perhaps become a template where a statutory commission is appropriate in other situations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a fundamental uh, to this bill and um, the 1846 Act is the concept of benefited land. I wonder if you could outline to the committee what uh, evidence-based considerations and precedents have informed the designation of benefited land as outlined in the bill? Well, the principle, well, the starting point has been the 1846 survey, um, which you've been presented with a photograph of. It's a very detailed document, and all the fields either side of the, uh, all the land either side of the POW um, was surveyed, and the, 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 the plan shows the areas of land which not only, some of, some, of the, some of that land floods or flooded, and some of that land, um, probably, probably two thirds of it, could not have been improved without the power and its side ditches being there. Um, the land could only be improved by installing drains. Drains have to have a minimum cover of two to three feet. They have to have a gradient or the water won't run, which means you have to have an outfall for those drains. Without the power in its side ditches, there would be no outfall, so the drains couldn't be installed, so the land could not be improved. So that's the, that's the basis of the, of the survey. Um, the commissioners uh, are all um, people who own land within the benefited area. They're all very familiar with it, um, and from practical, long, long practical experience, we know that the, the plan is fundamentally correct. So the 
definition of benefited land is predicated on a survey that was um, carried out in 1846, combined with the local experience and knowledge of um, existing heritors and uh, commissions. I just wonder if you've um, utilised any other um, resources, such as um, SEPA's modelled maps of flood risk area. SEPA's uh, flood risk maps are based on, um, from what I've seen of them in other situations, are pretty crude maps. They are... Um, I mean, there's not, they're not a result of anybody going to look on the ground, as a result of somebody looking at a plan. Um, I, d I do not think that they would have anything to add to the detail of the 1846 survey and the practical experience of the commissioners. The advantage that the 1846 uh, survey had was they could look at the ground before the improvements were carried out. So they surveyed it before and after these major improvements, something we can't recreate. Um, we can't go back and see what it looked like before these improvements were made, um, which seems why it's really appropriate to keep using their results. Okay. And, and just to clarify, what would you say are the, the fundamental reasons for the inconsistency between the SEPA um, flood assessments and the 1846 survey? I've seen of, of, of SEPA maps in other situations. It's a, it's a, so to speak, a broad brush uh, plan which shows there might be potential for flooding there. And the, the, w w when these when these plans are produced, the next thing you, that, that is called for is a detailed flood risk assessment. So they're not definitive. They're just an indication of a potential problem. Um, given your experience with the land. Within benefited land, would you say there's a, a spectrum of flood risk within benefited land? There's areas of benefited land more at risk of flood than others? There definitely is. I mean, some land floods and other land does not flood. But all of the land within a benefited area could not be improved because it, you couldn't install drains. If you can't install drains, if you haven't got an outfall for drains, you can't improve it. So even if it didn't flood, it would, it would only be at best rough grazing. Even so, given this differentiation between risks within benefited land, is it, would it be correct to say that some properties will benefit more than others as a result of the power? Well, the differences would be fairly marginal because I mean, either if, if you took away the if, if you took away the 1846 um, um, improvements, I would I, I would say that the benefited land would either be land which would flood or which would be at best rough grazing because you couldn't drain it. And if you can't drain it, you can't improve it. So you can you can tend to all areas designated as benefited land um, without the POW um, would um, not, for example, be able to um, have property situated on it? No, couldn't. Because if, you can't, if you're going to have a property, you've got to have drains. You've got to have surface water drains. You've got to have foul drains. If you've got nowhere for those drains to run, you can't build a house. OK. Just come back on that. The, 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 the power is fulfilling some flood alleviation function, but duly with that function, it's also enabling properties to have surface water and foul drainage. And that's our position that the residential properties could, couldn't have been consented without the opportunity of having surface water and um, foul drainage, which ultimately goes into the power. I mean, when you come on your inspection, we can go down and look at the wastewater treatment works, which serves the whole of the Balgowan Manor Kingdom development. And you'll see the outfall, and it's only, you know, not far above the bed of the power. So if the bed of the, if the power wasn't maintained, the wastewater treatment works wouldn't work. It's as simple as that. Okay. And obviously, understand that the 1846 Act in reference was made to substantial improvement works. Um, can you just state, state uh, for the record when the last substantial improvement works were uh, carried out? Was that at the time falling from the 1846 Act? Yeah. Well, uh, in, in, in during my tenure, well. During my tenure, there have been three things which have fundamentally um, changed with the power. The first thing was that uh, with um, the introduction of 360-degree excavators, um, we had to have an excavator track alongside the power. And, and then the machine digs the stuff out, and then it's got to put it down. And um, you, in order that it doesn't have to be carted away immediately, we have got over most of the power, we've got an excavator track, and then we've got a, beside it, we've got a, a strip of land where we can dump the spoil. And then periodically, 
it's loaded and t taken and tipped in low spots in the adjoining adjacent field. So that's one thing that's happened. Um, the next thing that happened was that in the 1880s, the power was regraded. There was scope to regrade the power between Red Hills and just upstream of Balgowan, which is going past the Balgowan development. And uh, that was regraded, and we managed to drop the bed of the power by about two foot there. And when you come on your inspection, we can, you can, we can see the uh, Balgowan Bridge, which is in the middle of the section which was regraded. And the foundations of the bridge had to be underpinned with concrete which shows you what, what was done. The next major regrading was uh, about 1995 when we got a grant from the Scottish Agricultural Department and what we did then was we um, lowered the whole bed of sandstone all the way through Dollery by about two foot. doesn't sound much but when you consider the, gr the gradients of the pow upstream of that is actually very significant. Um, and that necessitated two bridges being underpinned and uh, the scheme cost about £40,000. Um, we got a grant of £20,000 the, from the Scottish Agricultural Department and that enabled the power upstream to be regraded in the course of the annual clean. Um, the next Im improvement we have done is that the particularly in the section upstream from um, uh, the Ollery Bridge, the, the soils are very unstable and the banks tend to slip in. You clean it out and you come back a week later and you find the bank, banks have slipped in. So we've revetted the banks with a um, steel crash barrier, which is uh, basically putting a little barrier along the toe of the bank to stop it slipping in. And that's had a major improvement uh, it means that the power doesn't have to be cleaned out nearly as often as it used to. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder um, if, if I could just ask um, for a bit of um, clarification around this map that you very helpfully provided. Um, where it's marked dismantled railway, could you perhaps explain to me the, the length of that, that, that piece of land that includes the dismantled railway? And has that been added into the POW? Was the original POW that length and the, the, the real... It's, it's really to get a, a bit of background information as to why there's a, a part of the POW contains a dismantled railway. And, and is the POW the same depth all the way along or was it dug deeper to include the dismantled railway? The dismantled railway right, is parallel to the POW. Um, the, the 1846 um, plan, um, as well as surveying the... The, the benefited land also defines the sections of the power and its side ditches, which it was a statutory which the power commissioners are obliged to maintain. They're marked in red on the plan, and the the I mean the the, the blue squares on this plan are kilo, kilometer squares, so it gives you an idea of the lengths involved. Um, the, the, the main power channel itself is just over nine miles, and then the side ditches are about another four miles, so there's 13 miles of ditches to be maintained. Uh, in, the, um, in the bill, um, as re and following discussions with particularly the Balgaian residents, uh, it's been proposed to, in to extend the ditches which the Commission will maintain to include the ditch which runs along the east side of the Balgowan development and part of the way along the north, uh, the, the south side um, to alleviate flood risk there. But otherwise the sections of ditches which um, the Commission uh, will have a statutory obligation to maintain are proposed to stay the same. Good morning. I would like to ask you about the number of new heritors. There has been a net increase of 15 residential and commercial heritors at this stage. Would you say that's a result of the provisions in the bill? And also, will all 15 new heritors have previously been obliged to pay for the POW as a result of their title deeds? The, 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 the new heritors are primarily people... Um, well, if I explain the history of it, Balgowan... Um, I would say was was where in 1846 there was a station, and 
um, sometime after that, there was a sawmill constructed, and there were a series of little houses. I and mean, Hugh, you'll know more about this than me. They were shacks, wooden shacks to start with, that people were used um, by people on a temporary basis. Uh, and the landowner continued to pay the bill for that area of land. At some stage in the past, these have been sold off. They were used by members of the traveller community for a while. The POW lost control or lost the information of who owned the, the plots of land. So these, the area of land was always in the POW benefited land. Those landowners should always have been inheritors, but they, their names were lost, so they weren't send, sent bills. So this new, they weren't sent invoices, this new um, bill should make it fair and get everyone who is on benefited land back on the register. We're going to form a, a register of names officially to make sure it doesn't happen again. So they should all have been, if they were, def if the area of land the house was built on was defined as benefited under the 1846 Act, they should have been heritors, but we lost track of their names, which meant they didn't get invoices. So it's now a surprise to them that they are on the new list of, her of register. Right, so are you saying that you know if, if you've lost the list of them over the years, there would have been nothing on their title deed then? Is that? No, these people won't have it. It's only the Manor right. Kingdom, the new development, right, okay. will have it in their title deeds. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify, when was it Manor Kingdom was constructed? When was it? it was the early 1990s. Um, well, they always say, well, it weren't all built at once, but there was, it was in the early 1990s because I think it was in the late. 80s that Ovarup came to see me. Ovarup were, were the people who were doing the flood risk assessment for Manor Kingdom as a course of their planning application. And just so between 1846, just to clarify, understand, and 1990, that is a, the period where this lacuna emerges, where there was a lack of knowledge of the names. Yeah. So that's yeah. about okay. And so there various the, other uh, properties between Balga and around the lime store. Those houses would have been built then, wouldn't right. they? Right, the same. They? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just any any further comments on why these names were lost? Is it something within the act? I don't think they, they would have been originally part of probably the Ross Farm, wouldn't they? And then there would have been little bits of land sold off. Where the, where the lime store is? The lime store, maybe. Most of them would be around the, 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 sawmill. the, the sawmill, and the sawmill continued to pay the, the levy for some time, um, but not forever. If it didn't within the provisions of this bill going forward, any subsequent developments, that would not happen again? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can I just ask you about the function and the powers of, of the Commission? Because the, the Bill defines the Commission's functions as doing whatever is necessary or desirable, um, and, it, and it gives you the ability to repair, maintain and renew the POW and carry out improvements as are necessary. Um, do you think there is any risk associated with the Bill that heritors will have to pay significant costs towards this? Um. But no, is a short answer, because the, the commissioners are all heritors. Um, the, you know, up till now, the commissioners, the commissioners um, have, you know, we'd be turkeys voting for Christmas if we did that. Um, you know, we have had a, we've maintained modest budgets ever since I've been involved. Uh, the rate in the pound has not been increased for over 30 years. Um, you know, there's... There's no in, there's no interest in the I can assure you that there's no interest at all from the point of view of the power commissioners in in uh, in, in increasing the assessments. But, but not all heritors will be part of the commission. No, so there will be, be a group. They'll all be represented. Yeah. So a, a group of commissioners will be taking decisions for all of the heritors. True enough. But then um, we. The way, we've, the way we have, are proposing, what the bill proposes is that um, under, the present, under the present situation, the, 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 com the commissioners, um, I mean, it's not exactly, there isn't a sort of rush of volunteers to be commissioners, if you understand. I mean, um, people have to be more or less dragooned into it. Um, but um, 
the, the proposal in the bill is that there will be is that the power will be divided into four sections, and there will be uh, commissioners for each section. So each section will be fairly represented. Is the proposal? Mm -hmm. okay. Can I just add that, that that will include for the first time Balgowan being represented in in, in, in as one of the commission areas, yeah. uh, which doesn't so happen there will at the moment. Be a commissioner representing Balgowan. And the, will the, the, the costs of maintaining the POW be the same regardless of where about near the POW you live? Is the it a, a kind of standard charge across the, rate the, in the, of pound, the POW? The rate in the pound will be the same, proposing a uniform rate in the pound, yeah. Across yeah. And are you content that there are enough safeguards in the bill for heritors um, in, in relation to this, that, that costs won't be of a nature that would be difficult for some to pay? Well, we've debated this uh, a lot. Um, I mean, my concern is that having a bill is a hugely expensive thing. And, you know, the last two bills have been over 150 years apart. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think we're going to be able to come running along in 10 years' time and say we want some amending legislation. You know, it's just not affordable. So we're trying to make the thing as simple as possible so that if this has to last another 150 years, it, it will. So if you try introducing, uh, you know, RPI limits or some sort of artificial means of, con of, of you know, uh, I could just see that sort of causing problems uh, in, in the years ahead. And then we'll be back in the same situation where we've got a structural problem in the act that we're working with, but we can't afford to get it changed. Okay. And you will... Through the bill, you will have a, a list of all the heritors. You will have a new list drawn up, so you will know exactly um, who the heritors are al along the POW. The heritors that you didn't know were there, that were now going to be on the list, how, how are you explaining to them what the costs are, why they're paying, um, and, and what will be done on their behalf? What proposal is being put to them? We, we've had, first of all, we've had a series of public meetings with them to explain this whole process. Um, there will be heritors. There, there will be heritors meetings when things will be explained to them. Um, I think that's what that's the main thing that will happen. There was a consultation paper with details of the proposals, which was sent out to all the people who were identified by reference to the land register, the register of seizings, and local knowledge. We've also had. There is a there is a, a community body at Balgaran, and one of the well, two of the people from that from that um, who are who run that organisation have attended commissioners' meetings um, to hear, hear the debates and hear what we're trying to do. Joe, I think I think we should make clear there's 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 a, the Manor Kingdom development, the Balgaran development, and then I think you're also t talking about this sort of piecemeal sawmill shacks and houses here and there. So they're actually different categories. The Bulgarian development, there is reference in their title deeds to uh, an annual assessment. Um, so I think you're probably focusing on the, the other few people who it was felt reasonable in the context of the bill to now include because they are, their houses are in benefited land. I mean, they've actually had a kind of free ride <laughs> um, in the meantime. When you say you, you carried out a consultation, um, did every single person that lives on the benefited land take part in that consultation? They were invited. Yes. And How many took part? What do you mean? Well, at the meetings, you know, they were quite well attended. They were in the village hall, in the Gask village hall, which is only half a mile away from um, uh, Balgaran. And they were all invited, and um, uh, you know we had good, lively discussions. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, the resident association took the minutes and, and put them out for, to see on the web as well. And are you confident that every single person that lives on the benefited land um, was aware of the consultation? Yes, they were, yeah. all, they were all they were all written to. They were all invited to attend. So the, the consultation was not um, a document that people could read and give their, their views on. It was a it, verbal. It was an invitation was to come a, to a there, meeting. An invitation. It was there both. Was, there was, it was both. It was both. Yeah. And did you did you take and publish any minutes from those meetings? Was there any minutes. record of, of the discussion? 
we took minutes yes. and we and we considered the points that they had raised. And was that made public? Uh, not sure whether it was. Not as such. No. When you say not as such, what what do you mean by not as such? The minutes weren't sent out to the consultees. Was there a reason for that? It wasn't felt necessary. Why? Because th th these people are, are, are all on benefited land. They all have a vested interest in this. You want to be as open and a, as accountable as you possibly can be. So if not everyone has attended a meeting and you have taken a, a record of that meeting, it would seem logical to me that every single person on the benefited land would be sent a copy of the discussions that took place. Well, that and the outcomes. I just it might it help if, if the promoter provides a sort of written answer giving the detail of the consultation exercises which were undertaken and how feedback was, was taken into account in, in defining the various options which became the option to take it forward under the under the bill. Yeah, okay, that would be very helpful. Would that be helpful, yeah? yeah. That okay. would be helpful, yeah. Yeah. Would it also be possible for the committee to see the consultation documents and the responses and the minutes of the meeting? Of course. Of course, yeah. yes. That's fine. Yeah. And there was just one thing I wanted to follow up on. Um, given that in the, the interest of simplicity, there's not going to be safeguards, can I just say I'm correct in understanding it? Um, a heritor's ability to pay is not going to be taken into consideration. No. Uh, but then, you know, what's the difference between that and paying your electricity bill or paying your water bill or paying any other bill? Well, there's... There are differences in terms of state support. So if the situation is someone's asset rich but income poor, they're still going to be charged the same rate. That applies to farmers. Um, yes, that's the situation. That's exactly the situation which farmers are in. We have to pay. OK. Yes, could I, you know, heritors are able to pass, you know, resolutions. And these resolutions can be passed by the heritors who represent 75% of the sum of the chargeable values of the heritors' land. So it's really based on land acreage as opposed to one vote per heritor. So I was just wondering whether you felt this perhaps gives the large agricultural landowners disproportionate power over the residential landowners? And what would be your thoughts with regard to that system? It seemed proportionate on the basis that, um, that they are paying the bills, um, but yeah, that seemed like the right way to go. Okay, so are you the right way to go because you feel maybe if they own more of the land, they're maybe getting more benefit from the land, so they should be paying a higher bill, is that what you mean? I suppose they do pay a higher bill because they um, cumulatively get the, uh, the benefit from it. Um, it was on, yes, on a pay-as-you-go basis, I suppose. Okay. Right. Sorry, I just wanted to mention in terms of the section 9 of the bill and the alterations by heritors um, and that 75% sum of, of chargeable values, I think it's worth bearing in mind that those alterations are only to very um, specific parts of the bill in terms of, of the sections and it, it's not every decision um, as well that would be affected. Okay, so is that only under section 9 then? That it's I'm just mentioning in terms of section 9 um, and where you've got the the land being taken into account. Those alt um, alterations are, are very specific to parts of the bill. Okay, so section, other sections that that wouldn't be applicable. Is that? Um, oh, I'm just I'm just referring to to that yeah. specific yeah. section and those section. alterations. Yeah. I think that's just when we want to change, change. the boundaries, change the boundaries between the very lower, middle, and the upper parts of our function. Yeah. And it's not, structural changes. Not an everyday vote. It's actually section, section 3 6 is the where, where um, section 9 uh, comes into play. And and section 3 3 about excluding ditches. You can, um, so, j j just for example, a heritor's meeting may exclude ditches from the POW by a resolution passed in accordance with uh, section 9. And similarly, a heritor's meeting may alter the boundaries between the various sections of the POW in terms of um, section 9. That's, that's how it um, operates. Okay. 
which would alter the costs that people were bearing quite considerably. These are for big structural changes. Also, I should say for complaints, also bites it, it's section 2.3 as well, where a heritage meeting alters the number of commissioners for a section of any benefited section of land. Okay, thank you. So it's you. more to do with the administration of the, um, of the, of the POW in a sort of physical sense. Uh, regarding the uh, uh, commissioners themselves, why is it that heritors have a, a role in appointing commissioners but not in dismissing them? <laughs> um, I was just going to say um, that's a, a continuation of the position as it was under the 1846 Act um, and um, in practice the heritors would have um, a number of opportunities through heritors meetings to um, convey, convey the issues that they might have um, and there, thereafter it's for the, the other commissioners to, to take a decision in terms of the bill on um, why it might be necessary to terminate um, a commissioner's position and and really under the 1846 Act it was quite limited in the circumstances in which a, a commissioner might be um, stop being a commissioner in terms of change of land ownership or um, death essentially and that's kind of what what would happen in practice so this is the, the provisions in terms of termination intended to bring the commission as a, a statutory body more in line with um, other statutory commissions and termination provisions but um, in practice, heritors would, would have meetings with um, the commissioners um, and, and the commission and they'd have an opportunity to express any concerns that they might have. Okay, we can express concerns, but how are heritors able to hold commissioners to account? Because given in mind, it's been stated that this is a continuation of the 1846 Act. That's a conception of democracy less than 10 years after the Great Reform Act. We've moved on some point 170 years. Mm. I mean, in the 30 years I've been involved in this thing, and there have been heritors have been invited. I can only recall two heritors up until the consultation period. I can only recall two heritors ever turning up to a heritors meeting. Two heritors in 30 years. There's a huge. I mean, there's an excitement now because of this bill and the changes. But once this is over, I can tell you apathy will reign again, and there will People be. Start getting bills dropping through their doors that they weren't expecting. You may get a few more attendees. I, 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 you know, I think that's a point, a, a provision, potential provision we, we, we can have a think about and perhaps respond to you um, in, in, in light of questioning. Does the bill give any alternative tools or, or means for heritors who are unhappy with the Commissioner's performance to hold them to account, or to remove them? Not to remove them at present, no. It was intended the bill primarily would be the way to hold the Commissioners to account. It has defined fairly closely what the commissioners can and can't do um, and it would be illegal to not follow the bill for the commissioners not to follow the the bill so if i just can you want to clarify another point um for a, to become a commissioner you have to be a heritor but if there's a commissioner ceases to be a heritor can they continue being a commissioner and there's provisions within the bill to remove them in that situation no they can't you've got to be a heritor to be a commissioner Hub. If someone is a heritor and becomes a commissioner, but is a commissioner, but subsequently moves and is no longer a heritor, then he, has, then he can't, be a, can't be a commissioner. And you're That's quite clear. That the bill makes that provision clear. That's absolutely clear. They've okay. got to be heritors. You want to? Yeah, but because it, it would seem to me that the ultimate sanction that, that heritors would have in relation to the, the, the commissioners would be the ability to dismiss dismiss them if they didn't feel that they were carrying out their function. Correctly. And I, I accept what you say, that there has been a, a degree of apathy in the last 20, 30 years that you have been involved with the POW, but you don't know that that's going to be the case going forward. And, and you're, you're producing a bill which gives heritors no right of sanction. Well, maybe that's something we have to think about. Yeah, it's a provision we, we will consider carefully, I can assure you. There is a 10-year cycle. Ten years is a long, long time for someone to be in place that heritors are not happy with. And I'm sure you'll agree with that. I mean, I, it, honestly, it's quite difficult to find people to be commissioners. We do not have a, a, a waiting list of people wanting to do the job. Mm. What, what work have you undertaken to um, uh, publicise the role of the commission to those to heritors and to try to engage with heritors and encourage them to become involved? 
Mm. I suppose uh, the, the communication has been up until now by letters uh, publicising our annual accounts and what we've done in the year, um, which I suppose is noticed to anyone who wants to get involved. Was the, the, the role and function of the commissioners part of the consultation exercise that you did? Uh, I suppose so. Everything was available for consultation. Um, That's not actually what I asked you. Was it part of the consultation? Did you specifically ask in the consultation or did you specifically explain the role of the commissioners, who appoints them and who has the power of sanction? It was definitely explained at the public meetings, yes. But it, I, I can't remember it being put on paper, but it, it certainly was explained. And it is now in the bill, of course, which um, and the, they have had communications. What piece of paper did they get? Which does explain quite clearly how we intend the bill to work. That yes. Can you remind me, please, what the attendance or the average attendance was at these public meetings? About forty people. Yeah, thirty to forty people in, in, in and the whole. And a total of how many editors? Um, what are we now? 150, is it? No, 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 not as many as that. What um, new I, well, no, it's not as many as that. Um, no, hang on a minute. No, it's nothing like as many as that. Schedule of heritors and the numbering on the left goes down to 106. So the, the number of agricultural heritors is, is 29, and then um, there's currently 58 residential and commercial heritors, which will increase to 73, yeah. incorporating the, the heritors that have previously not been. Uh, charged. On the, on the, when, after the bill. Could you oh, maybe just so I'm just reading the consultation um, paper, which, which we will give to you after this meeting, but it, the, the, the appointment of the commissioners what is a specific matter that was mentioned. And just, just quoting from it, it is proposed that the commission should comprise seven commissioners who own benefited land representing the upper, middle, lower and Belgown sections of the benefited land. Commissioners would be appointed by a majority of the relevant heritors voting at the heritors' meeting in relation to the section of the benefited land to which the appointment relates. So there was discussion about that. I grant you there wasn't a, th this particular point you've raised about appointment, but not rights of dismissal. I don't think, I don't see that in the paper from a very preliminary reading, but the, the actual purpose and function and role of the new commissioners was a specific matter on which um, views were sought. And just remind me, was that consultation document only discussed at the town hall meetings or was there a consultation document issued to every editor? It was issued to um, everyone that the commissioner had identified as being a editor, so it was posted out to them okay. as well. That's, that's useful. Thank you. 2016, so that was a, it's quite a large document. Oh. And, and how many responses did you get? I, I think I'd need to check that. That's I'm sorry, continue. Not. We'll come back with our, with our written response on that. Okay, okay. I think we to come on six and seven, don't we? Maintenance. Um, can I ask you now about um, maintenance and repair of the POW? Because the two largest categories are spent are on cleaning and repairs, and between 2004 and 2016, just under 190,000 was spent by um, the Commission. Um, can, can you give us a bit more information on what, in, in detail, that, that involves, the cleaning and maintenance of the POW? Well, we have a... The, the budget for the POW for the last few years has been around about 18,000 a year, is what we've actually had... Well, the total, bu the total budget is of the assessments has been about 20, hasn't it, Shirley? Yeah. And then if you take off the administration costs, which are about, which we keep to the minimum, are about three. That leaves us 17,000 to spend on the power. Um, and we have a, we have a, basically what happens is that 
I walk the POW uh, generally in about February and uh, inspect it all and we look at the things that need to be done. Uh, I draw up a list of um, things that it, we, we, we could do. We have a, we have a commissioners meeting uh, usually about March, April. We look at the things and we decide which are the priorities and we instruct the work and keep trying to keep, well, always keeping it within within the uh, amount available. And that's what happens. Okay. So it's a mixture of cleaning, cleaning sections of the main channel, cleaning side ditches, um, repairing, revetting, this sort of thing. And according to your, the, 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 the chart, between 2015 and 16, there was no expenditure on cleaning and repairs. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, the money's been spent on promoting this bill. So what are the implications for the POW going forward, given that, that no maintenance or repairs have been done in two years? Well, there will be a backlog, but we had got the POW. In, one of the reasons for um, deciding that the, that the time was right to uh, promote this bill was that we had got the POW into a good state of repair. We had done a lot of revetting on the section between Dollery Bridge and Wood End, which is where we have these soft banks. And we'd got that into it. That was a section which we used to have to clean every year. We now, because of the revetting, only need to clean it every three or four years. So we felt that if we were going to take a break from maintenance, we had got it, the power into a good, good, good state. And we were hoping that this, you know, this is up. This process has taken longer than we thought. Um, but we thought that if we took a couple of years off, we could um, have the legislation updated and then get back to maintaining the power. And going forward, will the individuals who live in the benefited land, will they be given a schedule of work that, that will be done on an annual basis on the POW? I, I appreciate that you walk the POW and the Commission decides what work needs to be done, but how will that be communicated to the people that are going to pay for it? Primarily as a budget, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, as a budget of what, what work needs done and how much we think it will cost. It's as a the other thing that happens is that heritors write in periodically or contact us and say there's a problem in such and such an area, and we'll go and look at it and um, you know uh, if it needs to be dealt with it will get dealt with. Do you have a specific mechanism for communicating the ongoing work on an annual basis to all of the heritors? We haven't in the past, but it's probably something we should do. It's yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to um, mention in, in that regard that in Section 10 of the Bill it explains what has to be included in the annual assessment and part of the requirement of the, the annual assessment is that it, it specifically includes a breakdown of the budget so that the heritor receiving that assessment has an understanding of how that um, budget has, has been come up with. Okay, that's fine. And I, sorry, I don't know if it's helpful, but I can answer your previous question in terms of the consultation responses. Um, it's set out in the promoter's memorandum, which explains a little bit about the consultation paper, and there were seven responses received. Seven? Yes. Seven responses. Yes. Out of how many people? Um, that it was sent to. Mm -hmm. um, I'd need to, to double-check that, but it was um, sent to to everyone on the, on the, the Commission's list, but I, I can check that number from you, but it was seven responses that were received. So obviously the, the number of people it was sent to was greater and it would be more in line with the number of, of heritors that I set out. And are, are you aware if any further work was done to contact the people that, that hadn't responded? Because seven seems a, a, a fairly low number to respond. One interpretation could be that the explanation provided in the consultation paper and at the public meetings was, by and large, satisfactory. We have known that. Well, if people don't make objections, when hopes to assume that they're, by and large, happy. OK. Can I move on now to talk about... Um, the, the beaver, beaver barriers um, on the POW. Um, are you confident that they're effective enough? And given that no maintenance was done between 2015 and 2016, has that had any impact on the beaver barriers? Well, the, the, the situation with, the, with, with beavers is that um, if, 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 if beavers were allowed free reign on the POW, it would be, have a devastating impact because all the, all the all the land, certainly above Dollery, 
all the a lot of the, well, it would undo the, undo the work of the POW and it would be, be devastating for everybody. So last December, I I'm, I have a personal interest in this. I've got about 80 acres of land which will be wrecked if if the beavers were uncontrolled. Um, so I went to see Rosanna Cunningham last December because she's our constituency MP, uh, M MSP rather. Yes, uh, I went to see her and explained the problem to her, and uh, she kindly uh, contacted um, SNH, and they have a beaver expert called Royce Campbell Palmer, and she came to see me, and I took her around the POW and explained the problem to her, and um, she, it was she who came up with this idea that there should be a, a barrier to stop the beavers coming up from the urn um, and then she also thought there needed to be another barrier at the other end. The reason is because Methven Moss is a watershed. Um, the water runs, um, drains westwards down the power of Inchaffery and eastwards down another power which uh, goes, goes into the almond. And so you could get beavers coming up the almond as well as coming up the urn. So she thought there should be a, a beaver barrier uh, on the east pow, the one that runs to the almond as well, to stop them coming up the almond. Because they could come up, come up that pow, trot across uh, Methven Moss, and they're into our pow. So she came up with this idea, and um, uh, I, I've since had a meeting with um, John Burrows, who's the uh, SNH officer uh, dealing with beavers in the area, and they're interested in the POW being a trial beaver exclusion area. Um, there isn't yet a design for a beaver barrier. She's, in effect, asked us to produce one, which we're in the process of looking into. Uh, we've got a, we have a contractor who is very capable and who's looked after the POW for many years, and I'm discussing with him how this thing would, might be constructed and where it would be situated, and then we're going to go to SNH with proposals. So that's where we are. And then Rice and Campbell Palmer tells me that she and her team are licensed beaver, people who can handle beavers, and that they would basically catch the beavers between the two barriers and, and remove them. So that's the, that's the plan. Okay. Are there any other um, wildlife issues that affect the POW? Um, not that I can think of immediately. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could get invasive weeds. You could get you could get some uh, weed which was choking the power, or you could get uh, I don't know rabbits burrowing into the banks. Uh, but I mean, that, the beaver, the beavers, and I suppose in vegetation are the two main issues. Mm. Okay. Um, and just for completeness, before we um, we move on to other members that want to ask questions, can I just go back to the the, the issue of um, maintenance? And the cost. Um, are you considering putting a cap on on the bills that the the, the heritors will receive? Will there be a maximum charge that you will be allowed to levy? Well, it will be very difficult because, uh, as I see it, because if you say this bill's got to last for another 150 for another 150 years, how do you define a cap which is going to endure for that period of time? It seems to me that the thing is that, that, that the whole system is self-regulating in that it's. You know, supposing some some unforeseen calamity happened and we had to go and do something to sort it out, how would you how would you um, draft something which would uh, allow for that and also impose a meaningful cap? I, I'm struggling to see how one would do it if this is going to be if something that's going to have to endure for a long time. So potentially, if something quite catastrophic was to happen, heritors could be faced with an extremely large. Bill. Well, if it meant, for instance, that you know, that the drains at the Balgowan houses were not going to work, I'm sure they'd be very, very keen for us to do something about it. Uh, all their houses would be un uninhabitable. Okay. So how do you, how do you, you know, I just, I'm just struggling to see how you draft that. Again, the bill tries to restrict what we can spend money to to being necessary uh, at f for drainage, um, and that's the main point. We'll only do what's necessary, um, and we can't control what may be necessary. 
Okay, thank you. Another another small thing that's happened in the last few years, which we didn't know anything about. You know, we've got we've now got SEPA, uh, so we have to get a car license, and we have to do to do all the various things. Well, if SEPA suddenly put up their charges, or how do how do we how do we control that? You know. On the issue of, of the charging scheme, you wanted to come in. Well, I was going to look at assumed values. Is that you know, and you know, in relation to assumed values, what year or years were they used in the in the analysis of sale prices for comparable land? You know, what I'm really thinking about is whether the three hundred thousand figure for residential land took account of the recent economic downturn, which obviously had you know created difficulty for housing developments. Uh, I suppose, honestly, I suppose it hasn't. I mean, it was, uh, that was, um, these figures were, we've been you know, quite a while in drafting this bill. Um, equally, I suppose, the value of agricultural land has dipped in the last year or two, and that's not reflected in here, I suppose, as well. So one could argue that the whole thing needs to be updated, but then swings and roundabouts, you'll probably get much the same answer at the end. The charging scheme is based on acreage rather than the value of the buildings, and you know I'm just wondering whether this does not unfairly penalise someone with, say, a modest house on a rural plot, as opposed to somebody in a large house in a more compact plot, say, associated in a housing estate. Well, um, I suppose what we're trying to value is the is the uh, potential to build houses which the improvement to the power has created. Whether somebody builds a small house or a big house on their plot, it's up to them. Um, somebody could have a plot with a small house on and then go and put another house on the plot, um, you know, in the garden. We, we, we have no, you know, I mean, if the only thought that occurred to me as a possible refinement um, to that, um, which might be a way of making it a bit more sophisticated, is that... Um, I think you'll see in there there's a category for amenity land, which has a nil value. And um, the reason why we put that in is because um, at the Balgaran development, you've got the houses which are all sit on their individual plots. And then in the middle of it, you've got this common land. You've got a, what's that sort of green, you know? Well, that's obviously that's benefited land because it's within the benefited area, but it's got no value so it's that's why we put a nil value on it or is it no it's 500 pounds based on the fact that the the value of the land before the 1846 agreement is 500 pounds or so 500 pounds minus 500 is nothing so i suppose you could you could um say you could say that um the ground that goes with a house should be i don't know take an argument three times the footprint of the house and anything over that is immunity land you see what I mean? Yeah. You could say that in order to refine it, which would be a way, of, so if somebody's sitting with a small house on a large plot, then only part of the plot would be treated as the garden ground and the rest would be treated as, I mean, you could do that, which would be a refinement. You know, obviously, you know, I haven't seen the, the area until we obviously come in our, our walkabout. <laughs> Is there areas that you think could be in 5, 10, 15 years possibly become another manor kingdom? Because, you know, my concerns would be that if there was a development that, you know, two or three developments along this area of land, that will put strain, further strain really on the POW. And yes, also, um, you know, what, what would be your thoughts? Is there potential for that to happen? We don't what? see any specific sites, right, but okay. um, it is a concern of ours as well yeah, that yeah. Um, this could happen and hopefully the bill future proofs that it allows for uh, a revaluation in the event of a major change of land use land use so we could then revalue again if there was another oh. development we don't have powers to prevent development no, of course, of so course if the if planning office give them planning permission oh. it will happen the provisions of the of the the bill are that for all new development coming forward, there has to be a notice served on the commissioners, uh, so that the commissioners become aware and live to new development proposals coming forward. Right, sorry, that was me just slightly digressing as it came into my mind. Right, I would also like to ask you about the promoters. You know, if you could place on record the impact of the new assessment on both the ag residential and agricultural heritors. 
how much would how much their assessments would change. Yes. I think we've have we circulated those figures. Yeah. By the, we can provide uh, figures um, after the session to, to the Parliament to put in the public domain. The differences are pretty small. A lot of the residential ones go down from what they're assessed at the moment. Uh, some of the agricultural ones go up, but the differences are fairly minor. And just finally, why does the bill not provide for payment by instalments? You know, could this, you know, it's done with council tax, you know, it's, you know it could be... I suppose it, uh, the process one for Shirley, but it's mainly because we are, you know, we're always trying to minimise the costs of administration because we want to spend the money on the POW, not on complicated administration. Okay. That's basically the reason. Right. Okay. One other point of clarification in terms of the uh, terminology: why acreage and not hectares? Uh, I suppose it's just common usage. I mean, you know, if you, I, I work as a surveyor, and everybody talks about. If you ask somebody how much is your farm worth, they're not going to say, well, it's worth X pounds per hectare. Uh, or if you talk about building land, people talk about, you know, um, values per acre. It's just uh, how people speak. I, I, I don't think we'd have a, the promoter would have any difficulty in up updating it or providing it in both hectare and acres, if, if that would be. I know we're in the metric age, of course. Um, I'm just... Moving on slightly, um, what levels of um, historical debt are owed to the Commission? I don't have the accounts with me, but we can provide that. Yeah. And you, have you had challenges in debt collection in the past? Um, we have, well, we've basically had unpaid bills and um, the issue has always been, I mean, Shirley's more expert on this than me, but the issue has always been you know, the cost of recovering you know, very small sums. And usually the cost is rather more than, a lot more than the sum at stake. There wasn't so, a very big issue until uh, the Manor Kingdom um, houses came along. And when it came before the Commission, the committee, we decided to try and build unity. Um, and move forward to a, a new bill uh, and we decided in the interests of not causing it, it wouldn't help our case if we started pursuing debts um, it would be much better to try and build a bit of agreement on a way forward uh, unfortunately it's taken us longer than we thought it would um, to get this far um, but we haven't been pursuing uh, these debts recently okay and, and, and Specifically with the, the Balgaon estate um, being problematic, as I understand it, um, how did this come about, given that the owners, um, as I understand it, had relevant legal obligations in their title deeds? I think, again, I'm straying onto Shirley's territory, but when when um, the, the Manor Kingdom development started, as I say, Ovarup came to see me, and then the developers came to see me, and we, we, um, we discussed the... The, the assessment which should be applied to the to the houses and agreed that and then the plan was that there would be a deed of conditions which would I mean to be honest with you we were hoping that we wouldn't have to send out 54 assessments to these 54 houses we were our, our preference would have been that there would have been somebody factoring the the, um, uh, the development there would have been a factoring charge to the 54 houses, which would have included the assessment, and we'd have filled out one bill. That was would have been administratively far preferable for us. But um, it ended up that it, that didn't happen, and um, uh, the, the, there is a deed of conditions, and they are they they're all notified of that. But we're not actually party to that deed of conditions. We're not we're not legal party to it. Can you elaborate, Shirley? The deed of conditions does, does make reference to the householders having an obligation to pay, I think it is a 154th um, share of the levy payable to the Pau and Jaffrey commissioners. So they have been alerted to the fact that there is a charge. So it shouldn't have come as too much of a surprise when they got the bill. <laughs> okay. And... 
I wonder if you can clarify if Section 21 of the Bill empowers the Commission to recover historical debts um, from owners associated with the 1846 Act um, in relevant or conditions. Section 21. I think Joe and I have both understood that th this was to recover future debts rather than pre past debts. Past debts. It, it, it is, yes. I can clarify yeah. that. It, it relates to the powers to go to the Chair of Court to recover unpaid sums under this Act, should it be passed. It wouldn't cover under the 1846 Act. No, we would have to use the powers under the 1846 Act to recover but that, debts. And they will be repealed. And so you're writing that debt off then? I think that's what we're going to do. Going yeah. And just yeah. move forward. Yeah. So that's we'll, we'll have to consult on yeah. it. But, um, Is that not right? I, I don't think it will be officially written off. No. Um, what do you find out is that you're intending under the new bill to pursue these historical debts under the 1846 Act? I think so. We, we're not intending to have any powers to pursue historic debts. Under the new bill. Sec section 1 does actually retain um, all property rights, liabilities, and obligations of the Commission prior to incorporation are transferred to and vested in the Commission. So we haven't wiped everything out. We wouldn't propose to wipe all the, I mean, not just um, debts due to the Commission, but also all the obligations of the Commission that were there under the 1846 So this new bill Act. does make provision for pursuing these historical debts? Yes, in, in effect, uh, yes. Well, it, it, it puts them onto our books, but doesn't give us any power, new powers. To no new powers. No the new old, powers this off. is really just updating what was there before, which included pending and such historic methods of debt recovery. So it's, Under quite, the it's, it's transferring a debt, but you're not intending to actually pursue and use the powers of, a new, of the new bill to recover these debts. Yeah, we want to continue the paper and move on. You want to come in I don't, I don't think... Different? Well, the Commission haven't taken that decision. It's not been on an agenda for a meeting of the Commissioners, okay. so... If it, that if would going, be the... If, but if it's going to be part of, of this bill and you don't intend using the power, why have you included it in the bill? If it, now, it's one for a parliamentary um, draftsman, but it is obviously a saving provision to potentially pursue debts under the old Act. That's what Section 1.3 includes. I, th I think, I think in, in terms of the, the policy position of the Commissioners, which is where you're getting, are you going to write off old debt? I think the Commissioners need to, need to consider that and reach a view in, in a meeting as to what their policy is going to be. It will be part of this, this bill. There is the... the possibility that in the future a different set of commissioners could decide to use that power and collect historical debts? There, there is that power and I would like the opportunity to come back to you in writing on that when I've had an opportunity of discussing it further with the commissioners and with their parliamentary draftsmen, if I may. Okay, that's fine. Um, can I just ask you about uh, appeal mechanisms? Because um, in the bill in, in section 10 and 12, um, there is no third party right of appeal if, if people are unhappy about the, the annual budget or the proposed um, amendment to the land categories. Now, there was a right of appeal in the 1846 Act, but there is no right of appeal in this Act. Can I ask you why that is? I think the reason is because when, the, when there's a revaluation process, they, the, the, surveyor, the surveyor's um, valuations can be challenged by heritors at that stage, but once they are, um, once they're decided, the, the, the rates for each, the, the values for each category of land, um, the actual valuation at the end of the day is a mechanical process. You know, it's the area times the, um, the value for each category. Having a right of appeal in a bill is slightly different from um, a heritor being able to make representations to a surveyor? Um, 
I think the thinking was that if the if the if there was an appeal which was on a valuation matter and they took it to court, the court would then refer it to a surveyor, and you'd be back to square one. Hmm. But there is also no right of appeal on on the, the budget and the amount that you are going to have to pay on an annual basis. There is no right of appeal on that. No, there isn't. No. And was there so a that, reason that would, in effect, that would in effect come to a cap, wouldn't it? Yeah, but, but if if you are unhappy about the proposed budget. Um, and, and the proposed expenditure for, for the year, a heritor has no right of appeal, has no method of no. disputing. Yeah. I the, think the, the, the only remaining method would be under judicial review. And so there would be a method of going to the court if the trustees had not fulfilled their duties and powers properly uh, un, under the Act on a point of law. For example, if they were setting a budget uh, which was unnecessary for achieving effective drainage. So there is always going to be that, that inherent mechanism available to any third party challenging decisions of the commissioners. But, uh, but I think looking at it in the round, a decision has been taken obviously to, to keep costs down. And it was felt that the costs of uh, appeal mechanisms uh, would, would, would certainly you know, build up in terms of what, what the work of the commissioners are intended to do, which is to, to maintain and improve drainage. Um, I think, as, as uh, Jonathan uh, Guest has indicated, there are there are protection mechanisms in there because because the the actual assumed values are fixed within the bill itself. The three hundred thousand you've mentioned that's actually in the bill. So the only issue that third party objectors may have is to challenge to challenge the budget. I do accept that there that there, there may be tensions within that. I mean, in in terms of the the assumed value. The, the surveyor that's appointed has to act independently, and this is in the bill. He has to be a member of the RICS. Um, as you've pointed out, the um, heritors can make uh, representations uh, against that. Um, the surveyor has to have regard to these representations. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's felt that if, if a court appeal type appeal to the sheriff were, were available, then the sheriff would be deferring to what a surveyor would be seeing anyway, so would it not just come to the same thing? Almost. I'm an awful lot of what you say, though, on, on supposition. Mm -hmm. You are you are presuming, and, and you're 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 saying one thing, and then you're you're making a leap to something else. And and it would seem, on on the face of it, that this this bill weakens the ability for heritors to um to, to take disputes to get some kind of resolution for any problems that they have. It weakens the provision that was already in the 1846 bill. And if you can give me absolute clarification in the reasoning behind that, I think that would be very helpful. Well, I think I think we'd respond in writing if, if we could, because it's, yes. it's quite a yes, detailed like issue to. and has been considered in some depth that uh, would during, be helpful. during the Thank bill's you. evolution. Yeah. Can I just go back to these debts that we were discussing earlier? I'm looking for some legal clarification here. I'm a little confused. If, how, how historic are these debts that we're talking? Because you know, my understanding is is if you issue an invoice to somebody and they don't pay, surely you're time barred after a few years for actually chasing that. So five years. Five years. So prescription and limitations. Is that in have I missed the page where So it's five so do you have a a percentage? I mean what is the what is the value of people who haven't paid within the five years? We can provide that. Just, just out of, I would like to. Could you provide that, please? Yep, just we'll to see. Thank yeah. you. Thought it was. Th yeah. Can I just ask for for a bit of clarification? Um, we dis we discussed the spend on. Um, maintenance and repair, and in 2015-16 um, um, there was no cleaning and maintenance done, and I understand that monies were still collected, um, and the majority of the monies collected went into the work and the preparation of, of this bill. That's right. Did all the heritors agree that all the, the money that they were paying was to go towards that cost? Did the heritors know that the money they were paying for cleaning and maintenance of the POW was going towards this bill? They weren't told directly, the, but it was pretty obvious. There was no, they weren't all sent letters saying that decision had been made, no. So only those who took an interest would, would know that. So how, how many people paid in 2015-16? 
Um, all the, all uh, the agricultural people, and probably what at least half of the about residential. About half the houses and, and mm. about. So numbers, how many in the region? Of well, the far all the farmers, and um, probably at least half the houses paid. So 60, 60, 70? 70, 60, 70 like that. people mm. like that. Mm -hmm. And out of those 60 or 70 people, how many of them would know that the money that they were paying for maintenance and repair was going towards this bill? Well, all the ones it, who came to the meetings would It know. was widely known, um, but if someone was completely cut off from their neighbours and from what was going on, yes, they may not have known that. So you had no method of, of contacting all of the individuals to say to them, we are charging you X amount this year for maintenance, but we are not spending any money on maintenance because this is what we are doing with the money. You did not communicate that to the to the, the, the people that live on the land, no? No, not just, no. no. Not directly, no. no. They all knew. When you say not directly and they all knew, how can you be sure that they all knew? Well, I talk to them. I see them. They're all my neighbours. So yeah. every single person that lives on the benefited land knew that the money that they were paying was not being used for maintenance, it was being used for this bill. Every single one. Are you confident? I can't say that, but I can one? say an awful lot of them did because I spoke to them. And did every yeah. single one of them agree to the, 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 the money being used for the bill? Uh, nobody objected, no. Nobody thought it, everybody thought it was a good idea. Did they actually say that? To me, yes. Mm. OK. Thank you. Thanks. OK. Um, seven people on... Seven heritors responded to the consultation. We know that not everyone was necessarily aware of what the plans of the Commission were uh, regarding this bill. Um, that's people living on the benefited land. Supposing someone wants to move um, to the area and they're moving on to benefited land, at what point between deciding to move the area and actually purchasing a property would they be notified of the obligations? If you were buying farmland, you'd be told very, you'd be told straight away. Um, the house people, you 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 know about the conveyancing of houses, Shirley. Um, well, there's probably a number of ways that purchasers would be put on notice um, that there would be an obligation to pay an assessment to the POW. Um, particularly in rural areas where it can't be taken for granted that the property is connected to the public sewage system. Drainage is actually an issue um, that's paid particularly attention to by, by solicitors acting for purchasers. Um, I think, as Joe said, um, drainage of agricultural land would be the subject of due diligence by the surveyor acting for the purchaser and the solicitor. Um, and the matter would be covered by the missives, which is the contract for the sale and the purchase. And that would, the missives would cover drainage both for agricultural land and residential property. For a house purchase, the prospective purchaser would generally see the, the home report, um, and that should disclose the power assessment, both by the seller as a joint cost, in the, there's a property questionnaire section, and also in the survey report, um, which would, should reveal the private nature of the drainage. And the property questionnaire is a standard form prescribed by legislation, um, the, the Housing Scotland Act 2006, and there's regulations under that act. Um, and then there's Scottish standard clauses used throughout Scotland now in residential conveyancing. Um, the, the offer by the solicitor to purchase will make reference to the Scottish Standard Clause's second edition, whatever it is. And that includes a clause which states that the seller warrants that either the property is connected to the public sewer and drainage system or the property is connected to a private drainage system, which would be the case here. Um, and then it goes on to refer to septic tanks and compliance with SEPA and all that sort of thing. Another clause in the standard clauses makes provision for the production of a property inquiry certificate, and that's part of the normal sale process. 
and that discloses whether or not a property is connected again to a public drainage system. And if not, which would again be the case for the properties located on the benefited land, the purchaser is then put on notice to seek additional information as to the arrangements for drainage. Um, currently, the property inquiry certificates do already report quotes the subjects are not connected to a public sewage system maintained by Scottish Water. And it would be in the intention that once the bill goes through, that McCash and Hunter as Clark to the Commission would write to the companies that the private companies that provide property inquiry certificates to make them specifically aware of the new Act and ask them to spe specifically reference it in the search report. Um, as I've mentioned before, the houses built by Manor Kingdom, their title deeds make specific reference to the annual levy. So it should be um, clear from their title deeds and the deed of conditions. Um, also, the land plans, um, we, the, the Commission would make them publicly available. I think they're already publicly available as part of the bill. And um, we would make a small amendment to the bill we could do to give that public access to the land plans a statutory footing. Given all of that, why is it the case that people have moved in in the first contact to have with the Commission? It's when a bill pops through the door. The first awareness of the Commission. Sorry, could you say that again? Why, given all of these measures, then is it the case that people who have moved into residential property have first come into contact and awareness of the Commission when a charge arrives through the letterbox? There may be a number of explanations. The, their solicitor may not have told them. They may not have read the letter from the solicitor. Or, I mean, it's not unknown for people to hear what they want to hear. Or. Do you think that the Commission has an obligation to ensure that prospective purchasers of land or residential property within the benefited land should be aware that they will be subject quite to the often, burden? Quite often, people or their solicitors phone up to see, um, we're in the process of buying, um, and we understand that McCash and Hunter are clerks to the Commissioner. Can you tell us the current position? And they're, they're then told what the position is. Yeah. And you, you referenced a number of documents, and, and from the evidence that we've received, I, I'm not satisfied that they do actually give um, enough clarity and information for prospective purchasers. We received a, a written submission from Professor Robert Rennie, um, and as regards to the property inquiry um, uh, certificate, he makes reference to the fact that at the moment, he does not think the sort of scheme that you are, um, how entails, um, would be disclosed within a property inquiry certificate. Um, again, um, regarding the property question there, which you referenced in Scottish Water um, Sewage and Drainage Network, he states that there's a detailed question relating to private sewage connection to a septic tank, but that is different to a restricted statutory scheme. So would you accept that the existing information that's provided to prospective purchasers um, is not comprehensive enough to include um, and to inform prospective purchasers of their obligations should they purchase a property in benefited land? Well, what, what you're saying is that some people don't know, so de facto there, mm. there, there may be some gaps there. Um, but looking ahead... Address these gaps. Well, as I say, looking ahead, we would be contacting the, the companies that provide property inquiry certificates with a view to their making specific reference to the, to the power of Inchaffrey. Um Right now, um, all the householders know about it and they'll be under an obligation under the Act to tell the power commissioners when they sell a house. Um, there's also there's a new digital land and property information service being developed um, by the land register, I believe. Um, Scotless, Scott which is the Scottish land information system, and that would 
definitely seem to be the place for the pies arrangements to be flagged up looking to the future. Um, there's also been some talk looking to the future that uh, the, the, the Commission would develop a website um, where transparency, notice of meetings, agendas, uh, e easy ways of telling, you know, a link to tell the, or an email to tell the, the Commission clerk when a house is, is changing hands. Um, that would be looked at, but that's the sort of thing that probably isn't appropriate to put in a statute. But certainly the Commission, I think, would be intending to make things as uh, as public as possible. Yeah, but, but this bill makes no provision for land plans which can be public, publicly inspected. And well, I, think, pow, pow, I, think, pow, I think we would amend the bill to include that if, if that was felt to be useful and helpful. Would the register of editors, would you consider amending to make that publicly searchable? That's not, public, that's not included in the bill either. Sorry, just to say, I think that consideration would need to be given in terms of what on the register of heritage would be made felt, um, felt necessary to be made available just to ensure that it's completely compliant with data protection requirements. Is that something you'll look at? Um, it's, it's something we can consider if it's felt that it's necessary for the register of heritage to be made available and, and the Commission can consider that. But definitely with the, the land plans, I think there's consensus that that would have been practiced in practice, they would have been made available, and, and there's absolutely no problem with doing that, and they're, they're publicly available at the moment. So you will make changes to the bill? In, in terms of the land plans. OK. And just, and just finally, um, land plans, what cartographic standards do they adhere to? Sorry? The land plans, what standards do they adhere to? It's all based on Ordnance Survey material. It's all been... They were, they were, the land plans were drawn up in my office by uh, using, a, using a software called MapInfo. Um, uh, so all the, all the boundaries are accurately shown and the areas have been accurately calculated. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? No. no on, behalf of the, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank the commissioners and the officials for attending today. Um, it was decided under item one to take the next item in private, um, so we will now suspend business to move into private session.